Welcome to ECNV's Conversation with Jennifer Todd McDonald, Project Director and Virginia Project Search Statewide Coordinator for Virginia Commonwealth University. Today's conversation is brought to you by Marcos Castillo, Emma Budway, Teresa Champion, Joshua Wilson, and DRC Neal as ECNV's Agents of Change, a consultant group comprised of people with disabilities made possible by the Ford Foundation. Through the Agents of Change, we look at and tackle big questions about disability and society today. Today's conversation is around the question of disability employment and the coronavirus pandemic and took place May 19th, 2022. Please enjoy. Uh, we work with ECNP. Uh, the Independent Center of Northern Virginia uh, as part of an initiative um, that they call the Agents of Change. Uh, and basically our job is to kind of think about how to bring disability forward into like the 21st century model because a lot of what people do with disability is based in like a 1960s kind of vibe, which has worked really well. Um, but, you know, we've been working with a lot of different people who are more interested in trying to think about what the next version of it would look like. So uh, we are talking about employment and jobs um, this month. And so a key part of this whole discussion uh, very much is VR. And of course your name came up. So um, I'm gonna let Josh uh, introduce uh, the questions that he has for you. Um, this is his show. Uh, because I understand, I guess the two of you have worked together. <laughs> and so Josh was the one who gave us your information and uh, we're really grateful for that, so. Thank you. Josh, do you, want to, do you want me to tell them a little bit about myself? Please tell us about yourself. Huh, there you go. <laughs> so nice segue, huh? So <laughs> Josh and I have known each other probably longer than we realized we knew each other. We actually went to the same high school together. Um, I am older than him. He will quickly point that out. Um, and he was my very first customer when I've worked here at Virginia Commonwealth University's Rehabilitation Research and Training Center. We are pretty much a totally grant funded organization. And um, I started my career here 25 years ago as a job coach or an employment specialist. And I was working on a grant specifically to support individuals with physical disabilities and finding employment. And I was fresh out of college, fresh out of graduate school, had very little experience and was handed a caseload and some training and said, go find these folks some employment. And Josh was one of the first people I met. And I walked into his apartment and he immediately started giving me a hard time and making fun of me. So I knew that we had a relationship that would last because I was going to dish it back just as quickly as he gave it to me. Yeah. So um, over the years, I assisted him in finding employment and training him in a job. And then um, I have since moved into other roles within the center. I stayed as a job coach for a couple of years, and then I moved into um, training division and then um, research. And so now I serve as a project director uh, with our center looking at employment models that help individuals with disabilities find employment, as well as um, creating partnerships with businesses because we need those partnerships to be successful. <clears throat> and, and Josh and I developed a, a strong bond over the years. And so he and I stay in touch and he emails me on occasion and says, hey, can you, can you edit this? Or what do you think of that? Or, you know, who should I call for this? And yeah. um, when they tried to take Josh away from me on my caseload, I was like, no, absolutely not. He's He's yeah. always with me, so. Uh, that's really nice. I actually didn't realize people had personal relationships with VR counselors because I damn sure not have not spoken with mine. <laughs> well, I don't think I'm technically a VR counselor. I, I am a CRC, but 
technically I was a job coach or an employment specialist at the time. So I didn't work for the state, you know, VR agency. So that it was a little different. So. Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, Josh, uh, why don't you give us the first question? And then if people have follow up questions or things that they want to add, um, feel free to put it in the chat and I will try and catch it. When has COVID changed the amount of people with disabilities working from home? Can you repeat that, Josh? The very first part I missed. Okay. Is this just from, is this like just me answering this or is everybody participating yeah. just to? Oh, I mean, it's it's really just you. I mean, so so what we're looking for is the perspective of, of people who, who do this work. So okay. people whose jobs are to connect folks with disabilities to employment. So, you know, we were thinking, what are they doing? Like how <laughs> COVID has disrupted so much that like, what are you doing in your job? And like, how is this, is it harder or easier? And so that's kind of the number, the, kind of questions that we're focusing on. And, and just a follow-up question, do all of y'all work for the Independent Center or or who are you all? Yeah, so uh, so we're, we work for the ECNV as a group through the Ford Foundation uh, called the Agents of Change. Okay. Um, and we're, um, picking little things that we think would help with the transition into a more interdependent, there we go, consultants, um, into a more interdependent. Uh, so this is kind of like a thinking lab and, um, and this is our, uh, our employment branch. Our questions are leading towards a specific question uh, and, and you'll start noticing it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it is COVID and pandemic and employment related. Uh, so we're kind of looking for experts to clarify what's going on in the field. Okay, that's helpful. Um, so has COVID changed the amount of people with disabilities working from home? I can only speak to my experience on this. Um, and it has changed some. But I would say, you know, it has, what I've noticed is that businesses are looking at diversity and inclusion differently as a result of COVID and, and everything that happened in 2020 and 2021. And so I think prior to the pandemic, in my role, we were starting to see some shifts in, and I'm speaking mostly from the large business perspective, really, <clears throat> um, where we were getting some businesses to reach out to us to say, hey, we really want to look at our, our labor pool, our talent pool. Um, we want to be more inclusive. We want to be more diverse. But there wasn't a whole lot of action necessarily behind that. Since the pandemic and coming, out, you know, out of the pandemic and in the midst of it, I, I've seen a huge shift in that businesses are far more open to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and are reaching out like they never have in 25 years. Um, they are hiring individual, our customers at a rate that I've never seen. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, we are, but I wouldn't say that it's a huge number of people working from home. I think when the pandemic happened, a lot of the individuals that we support continued employment, some of them transitioning to home, but really a small percentage. And I couldn't tell you what that percentage is but just speaking off the top of my head, I would say it was a small percentage. And then they were quickly brought back into their places of business 
And what we found was that a lot of the individuals that we support were considered essential workers and, and really worked pretty much throughout the pandemic. And, um, and if they weren't working, found employment pretty quickly after um, the height of the pandemic, if you will. If I could follow up, so I wanted to ask, um, are we talking about employment like, um, so I was thinking, uh, I had an internship at NASA at one point and uh, Melwood Services uh, was one of the contractors that NASA uses primarily comprised of people with intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. And they were the like janitorial services mm -hmm. for the NASA mm -hmm. uh, agencies. So I guess that would be considered essential like, are those things that are like essential work? Is, is that what you're talking about? Or is it, is it a different kind of employment? Well, just some clarification. We at, at VCU, RRTC, we do not um, support anything other than community integrated employment. So we only work um, in environments where individuals are fully integrated and in their community receiving at least minimum wage. So some of the other organizations um, where, where it's a large number of people with disabilities that are working on a contract, that's not our model. Um, and as far as who is considered essential workers, we have a number of individual, because of the work that we've done over the years, we have a number of individuals that are working in hospitals and are, um, whether it's in the intensive care unit stocking supplies, whether it's the pharmacy where they're running meds from, in, from the pharmacy to the outpatient infusion clinic, um, to the child care center. We have a wide variety of individuals that are, um, that are working in a, a large number of unique work settings. We try to avoid traditional um, employment, you know, as far as what people with disabilities have often been found employment in, um, you know. So we do have individuals who want to go to work where they're doing cleaning tasks or janitorial services. And if that's your dream, then we will assist you in finding that type of employment. But we're really looking for non-traditional employment in the community. So it sounded like you, you, the medical profession was where your essential workers. Yeah, we also have um, individuals that work in our school systems. We have, and, and there are people that work in restaurants, um, you know, so... <clears throat> and I don't have a, I'm sorry, I don't have my cheat sheet in front of me that has where everybody's working, but, you know, retail-based employment, things like that, where people were spending a ton of money during the pandemic, and so there were, there were those types of positions as well, but we do have an, a good number of people in the healthcare industry, too. Thank you. <laughs> Josh, you can tell me, I just want to ask, uh, you can say yes or no, because I'm wondering if the question I want to ask is one of the questions you have on the list. Uh, do you have a question that talks about what makes a business change their mind? I don't want to steal your thunder, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Do you say yes? Yeah, yeah. Okay, then I will table that question. Then I have a question. Oh, I actually have two questions. Do you, is there any jobs that your organization steers away from that's like, no, these aren't good jobs for, um, you know, long-term employment for people with disabilities that are just traditionally jobs where they would stick people with disabilities in there just to check the box of employment and then it not being a fruitful job. I think what 
we do is we look at who the individual is. We try to get a really good understanding of what their interests are, what their abilities are, where their skills lie, and what they want to do. Um, and I also provide um, training to other employment specialists, and we have some online courses. And I think what job coaches often fall victim to just because they don't know what to do and they've been you know like they they want to help people and and then all of a sudden you say well you got to go out and talk to a business you know if you're a job coach or your employment specialist and they're like well I didn't know I was going to have to do that you know I just want to help people and so they they don't know how to talk to businesses so they just do what's easy to them which is go to some of those places where positions turn over very quickly and they say, don't you want to work here? And wouldn't this be great? And, and again, you know, I am speaking globally and, but it's from my experience, um, what I see people say to us. And so, <clears throat> and so what we try to instill in our coaches is sometimes people come to us and they say, well, I want to go to work and I want to clean because that's the only thing that they know. They don't, they've never had an opportunity to try a number of different activities, another a number of different types of work tasks. So we want to give them an opportunity to try, you know, some other activities and a number of different types of job tasks. And if they come back and say, you know what, I want to, I want to clean, then that's fine. Then that's what we're going to do. But we're not going to do it because that's easy. Um, and because we also know that if that's not a good match, then it's just going to be a failure for the employee and the business and more work for us as well. And, and so we, we really try to look at who the individual is and what are they looking for. <clears throat> um, and kind of go from there. Thank you. So Emma asks, what accommodations are available to individuals? Oops, sorry, just disappeared on me. Who do not speak and require a communication partner? It is more than a job coach. So in my experience, Emma, we've tried a couple of different things. Um, Josh, for example. Yeah. Used, used his Dynabox when we were working together. And it just, and he's not the only person that I've worked with or that our center has worked with that needed some other type of communication style to communicate with their coworkers and um, supervisors. And so it's really just about educating that supervisor and coworker on um, you know, this is Josh, and these are all the skills that he brings. And if you need somebody to take apart a computer and put it back together, he, he's your man. And here's how he'll do it. And here are, here's all the other amazing things about him, always focusing on what Josh can do. And then saying, you know, you may be wondering how you're going to communicate with Josh. Well, Josh has already got that figured out. He's got this amazing Donna box and he's going to type his questions into it, or he's going to type his, whatever he wants to communicate into it. And he's going to use that to communicate with you. <clears throat> so really just educating the business. Uh, okay.
how much are employees, oh, how much of employees, employers are, except, I'm sorry, it keeps moving back and forth. How much are employers accepting of people with disabilities? I think that <clears throat> now more than ever, employers are accepting individuals with, because more times than not nowadays, disability and that piece of who we are is touching all of us more and more. And um, so if you put 100 people into a conference room and you say, how many of you are touched by um, disability, whether it's you yourself has a, have a disability or you have a child with a disability or a parent that has acquired a disability as they aged or have a neighbor, um, you know, I think that almost everybody's hand would raise. When I started my job many years ago, that wasn't necessarily the case. And so I think it, it, it is, um, we're all touched by it in different ways than we used to be. And, and so we're more accepting and uh, more open to inclusion than ever before. Did it, I just wanna ask, do you think it took the pandemic to make that happen? I think the pandemic didn't hurt. I mean, the pandemic hurt a lot of things, <clears throat> but I think, you know, mental health was such a topic during the pandemic and we all struggled. I say we all, many of us struggled with, you know, um, with our own mental health, being alone or being stuck in the house and people really finding their voices to say, you know, I'm struggling with this and, and I need help. I think the pandemic pushed that out there. And so now it's, it's more accepted maybe, you know, and we're all more open to it and more cognizant of it than maybe people were before. You know, those of us in the field have always been involved in this. So, but whether or not the general public was maybe, maybe so, Darcy. Um, I also just wonder, and, and you were saying like, you know, people in the field, you know, you've been doing this work for a very long time. So you know what you're talking about. I was just also wondering, do you find it in your experience that employers are, you said VCU works for people with physical disabilities, which I thought was interesting. That was when I started. I, when I started, I was working on a specific grant, just working with people with physical, physical disabilities. But our center works with individuals with all types of disabilities. That was just the one particular grant at that time. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, no, that's totally fine. Because that's actually, I just wanted to ask, do you find that employer that it's harder? Because, um, I mean, ableism is global. But I do try to explain to people that there is a difference between the way that employers view physical disabilities versus intellectual ones. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, do you do you find that replicated in your work or is that something that people just, is that like an assumption that is not true? I think that in my time here, I've actually spent more time working with people with cognitive and intellectual and developmental disabilities than people with physical disabilities. So I think I, I have you know, more experience in that area than working with people with physical disabilities. But I think when you say to a business or to really anybody, I think it used to be that when you said the word disability you know, or that someone had a disability, everybody's first inclination was to go to a physical disability. I think that's different now. I, and, you know, I think the, the rates of um, individuals with autism is so much higher now. And that um, I think people think a little bit more globally than they used to. <clears throat> Emma's question 
it kind of jumps off of that. Um, Inclusion is one thing, presuming competence is another. How do you train supervisors and colleagues to presume competence? It's a great question, Emma. Um, we started a project about 12 years ago, and it was to help um, young adults learn job skills and then help them find employment. And <clears throat> it was based in a business. And so, and we come from a mindset of ability and always have. And so I think maybe that impacts how we approach things. So, um, but we are always looking at what can you do? What can you bring to a business? And then really selling that, if you will, to the business and, um, and that you, you know, the individuals that we're supporting are going to impact the business's bottom line because the business has to produce, they have to meet their goals and things like that. And so we come from that mindset and, and we talk about that to our um, staff. And we talk about that if you, if you don't think that somebody that you're working with has the ability to work, nobody else is going to believe that either. You know, like nobody else is going to, if I don't believe that Josh can do this job, nobody else, I, I'm not gonna be able to convince a business that Josh can do this job. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I have to believe in Josh. And if I'm not his biggest advocate and his biggest supporter, then I'm never going to bring his abilities to light in front of a business. And so when we started that project 12 years ago, we kind of brought that mindset into this business that we're going to bring these young adults that are going to be of great benefit to your business. <clears throat> and we expected um, each of those young adults to rise to the occasion. We knew they would. And we modeled that in the business and, um, and the business bought in, bought in and, and they saw that, yes, you are correct, Jennifer. These kids can do great things and they are changing our perspectives and they're changing our work culture um, so the young adult that was working in the pediatric intensive care unit that he was actually born into was once a very kind of their, their, the environment was challenging. They, they deal with really troubling situations every day. And they never saw where those kids went after they left the pediatric intensive care unit. And now this young adult who's 22 comes in with this amazing personality with these skills and is we're able to say, well, he was here 22 years ago. You all helped him. And now they see that change and that you know, and, and we talk, we hear from schools a lot of times that, you know, they send kids off after they graduate and they never know what happens to them. And I feel sorry for those, those folks, because we get to see that we get to see how much each person grows and develops and, and, you know, how they change over time and, and their confidence level and their impact on the world. And for people to not be able to see that, you know, is, is unfortunate. And so, um, I don't know, I feel like I'm rambling, but I get a bit passionate. So. No, I, I actually am really interested in, in the, in what you were saying. Um, I have a gentleman in my community right now. He's uh, indigenous. He's going to turn 18. He's going to graduate high school in the next few weeks and they're dropping the ball on him. And, um, he has um, he has a tumor um, that 
complicates some of his breathing and stuff. But other than that, he's he's able that to do this about any. Yes, yes. It like he has everything ahead of him, but they're failing him. He mm -hmm. they're going to drop the ball. Um, one of the things that infuriates me is I'm not allowed to go and pick up the ball. Um, right. I'm not even supposed to know that the ball exists. Um, and he lives so insulated in his uh, group home that we're trying to figure out a way to actually do it. But it's it's exactly that. They, they're failing him um, in the most crucial time. And, um, and yeah, if if it's infuriating me to know of one case, I can imagine how many come across your desk all the time. But that transition, especially um, I had my accident at 18. So I think of the pivotal time that that time in your life is. Um, and the transition from high school to adulthood and knowing who you are and what you're going to possibly do for the rest of your life as, as a citizen and an employee. Um, is uh, is something, I mean, it, it's, I'm in Arizona. So we have a different system than what you guys have in Virginia. Um, but it sounds like you guys have uh, a better um, VR type of system for people to get. Um, I, and I know that you, that your employer isn't uh, VR, but under the same kind of umbrella of, um, you know, getting back to work. Um, what programs do you, you guys have in the state that helps with transition services? So we have- We're um, talking about the program that you guys set up about 10 years ago. Uh -huh. that, that program was Project Search. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It was based out of Cincinnati Children's Hospital and we adapted it specifically for young adults with autism. Um, because we felt like they had a, had a model and we didn't know if it would work for individuals with autism, but we wanted to try that. And we found that with that model as the basis and additional supports on top of that, it was very successful and it has continued to um, work not only for individuals with autism, but with other disabilities as well, but we still kind of maintain that that additional support to it or to the individuals that come through there. Um, it, it, that's probably for us at our office, that's probably the main transition program that we utilize is that internship, nine-month internship-based program within um, a local business. And at the conclusion of it, our coaches assist the young adults in finding employment somewhere in the community, either at the host site or somewhere else, um, depending on what they're looking for. It's a great model, but it doesn't work for everybody because there are kids who um, are on a standard diploma track who that is not available to because you have to re be receiving, um, if you're receiving a standard diploma, then it doesn't allow you to stay into in the school system to receive the services because if you get a standard diploma, once you graduate, you're done and that's that. Um, so there, there are other programs out there, um, SOS, and I should know what that stands for because we run it out of our, office, but I don't know what it stands for, and I apologize, um, but that does serve um, young adults who are achieving a standard diploma, um, and, you know, which is nice, because I hate it when parents call me, and they say, my child graduated last year, and we really want to participate in your project, and I'm like, well, you're you know, you're, you're aged out or you've graduated or whatever the case may be. So then it's going back to VR, if they're not already connected, to kind of go through the traditional model of supported or customized employment with our, with our office. And do you guys ever reach out and, like, I know that you guys are getting a huge Amazon um, warehouse in the area and they're going to do all kinds of 
um, infrastructure changes. Um, do you guys have uh, any programs that work? I know you said that you guys reach out to businesses. Seems like a pretty big business. We do. I think the. Um, I think that Amazon is located in Northern Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. And so yeah. we're based in Richmond, and we provide services in Richmond and kind of the tri cities, if you will, which is everything within about a 45 minute drive from us. We also go down towards the beach a little bit, um, but we are partnered with the hospitals. We're partnered with some military bases. We have partnered with other large businesses in the area. And yes, we do reach out, um, but we also get a lot of word of mouth. You know, so I'm partnered with this business and that business, somebody from that business that's working with me goes to an event and they start talking about this partnership that they have with Jen McDonough and VCU. And then they call me and say, hey, we want to do what they're doing um, or through um, a business advisory committee that I sit on um, with other businesses in the area. But we're always looking for businesses. So we are happy to connect with businesses. I have, um, I, I, that's my passion. Um, Josh asks, have we ever found a person who has a disability, a job working from home? Did I miss anything before that? Okay. I think I did, but I'll come back to that. Um, we, we have, and it's been through a partnership with a business, and it's been since the pandemic, of course, and it has been <clears throat> through one of our internship programs, intern internship to permanent employment. So, um, but we are seeing that most of our businesses now that we're working with are returning to the office and they're re requiring their employees to return to the office. So if we got someone a position um, that was working from home, now they're coming into the office. And so I actually just had two people apply for two different positions that were originally, and like originally, I mean, two months ago, they, the managers of those departments said, okay, these are going to be work from home positions. You know, we need to plan for that. And, you know, two months later, here we are in May and they're saying, well, everybody's coming back into the office. So these positions are going to be face to face. So I think the shift is going back to face to face for most of the folks we're working with. If you had to, um, I was going to ask if you had to categorize, you know, like for example, you know, we had thought just based on assumption that with the pandemic and with everything going virtual, that telework would be the way to go for, for folks with disabilities. But based on what you're saying, that sounds like it's not necessarily the case. So, uh, you know, might you make a recommendation for? where people with disabilities might look for employment post-corona? Yeah, I, I think that um, that's just been our experience. So I just wanna make sure that, you know, there might be another employment provider that has a lot of people that are working from home or is actively helping people find employment from home. That's just not been, our experience. Um, so can you tell me the second part of that question? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, no, I was I was just basically, yeah, I mean, that's what you were saying. Like you were saying that, that that's y'all's experience. I was just wondering, I, like I said, I'm kind of surprised yeah. to hear that, that, that that's not the term. Cause I just kind of assumed that that would be right. the natural term that everybody was making because mm -hmm. it honestly just makes so much sense. But right. based off what you're saying, if people really are going back into the office, if things are returning back to 
work as they were. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't want to say, is there a magic pill for, for disabled people? But, you know, is there a place that people should be looking if it's not telework? I don't think that there's a magic place. I think what we're seeing in general, and I, I mean, I can say this of, about personal experiences, you know, within my family, is that businesses are open to the discussion of telework now, and they used to not be at all, or it used to be on one day a month, and it was because there was somebody coming to work on your house, and that's why you were going to work from home. I mean, that's how I used to work from home, but now if I just need a space that has fewer interruptions because y'all are asking me to write something and that's not my favorite thing to do and I need silence and y'all to stop knocking on my door, then I'll work from home that day. But I think now, you know, businesses are more open to that possibility. And um, I think that they, at least with the businesses that I've been talking to recently, they would certainly be open to having that, um, like Marco said, could you request that as an accommodation? Absolutely. You know, if you disclose that you have a disability and that that is an accommodation that you need, I think businesses are, are definitely open to it. And I think the larger the business, potentially, I don't know why I say this, but I, I feel, and maybe it's because that's who I've been working with. Um, I think maybe they're, they're more open to it because they've seen it be successful. I mean, I would still be interested. I mean, I, I just know having worked for the federal government, they were super resistant. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, I mean, literally people kept telling me, you know, we can only do that in the act of God. Like they were literally, that was what they said. And on the HR, on our timesheets, you could put act of God as an actual time code to as proof right. as to why you didn't need to be in the office that yeah. day, which I thought right. is like, it's the epitome of, of ridiculousness for this very reason. So um, yeah, I, it just, it seems like, uh, like, I know, I know for a fact that uh, requesting that as an accommodation uh, before the pandemic would have gotten most of us left out of the room. Um, and now it's, it's taken seriously. It's, it, it, yeah. Because they it's, saw people work from home successfully. Because they know? hit the light switch for what I like to call the able. Right. Yeah. Um, we did miss a question. Uh, we missed Emma's question and she was asking, she said, uh, what recommendations would you make to better prepare students for post-school life, school transition programs or a joke? Um, thanks, Emma. I think the more we can get students out of, build out of school buildings and into businesses, the better off we are. We know that if students aren't employed when they graduate, that they're, um, it takes longer to help them find employment after graduation. So if we can, if we can connect them to service providers earlier, if we can create a team around them to support them and to advocate with them for those services, um, I think pre-employment transition services are a, a great opportunity that's out there. I think it's still somewhat new just because of the pandemic. And so we started providing that services in different states and then the pandemic happened and kind of messed everything up. And now hopefully we'll get more of those services offered um, this year. But I think I think that the more real work experiences kids can have, um, I mean, whether they have a disability or not, I mean, if I had had an opportunity to try out some different jobs when I was in high school, maybe I would have been better prepared to know what the heck I wanted to do when I got out of high school. So, um, 
you know, and, and there's so many challenges that go along with that. And I get that, <clears throat> but, you know, it, it, the more rural the, the environment for the school, I live out in the country, you know, there's like not as many opportunities or it takes the bus longer to get kids from the school to a business. And there's all of that expense that, you know, that somebody's going to fight with you about. Um, but it really does change our young adults and, and gives them that opportunity, like I was saying, to try out different jobs and to not just know about those traditional jobs. And, you know, let me try some clerical duties. Let me try some stocking duties. Let me try all of these other opportunities out there for a few weeks to see what I like and what I don't like. And I, and I think schools are doing a better job of that. Uh, there are, are more transition programs than there were 10 years ago. When we started Project Search, that was the only option out there. Now, you know, within my county alone, there are all these other programs out there that we don't provide, but that is out there that, you know, that school that or that students have um, the opportunity to utilize. Yeah, I was going to say you um, you brought up and I, I do I want to be cognizant of both your time and everyone's time. Um, Josh was saying uh, you answered all the questions, so that was, that was good. I want to make sure that if there were any others he wanted to add that he could ask. But I do want to add that you brought up something I think really interesting with this comment uh, this comment about living in the country because I was thinking. You know, I'm from North Carolina. That's where I grew up. I went and, to college there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I always tell people it's a wonderful place to grow up, but I damn sure don't want to live there. And like, I'm just kind of like the, I mean, literally I moved to DC a week after I graduated from college because <laughs> I was like, deuces, I'm out of here. But yeah. like, You're that guy. You're that guy in high school that says when I get my diploma, I'm running off the stage into the car and leaving. Uh, I graduated a whole semester early. I got out at three and a half years because I wasn't trying to play that game. But but the point was, I my whole thing, so the, that's the question. Because I realized as, as you were talking, I was thinking to myself, this is a part of disability that people don't think about at all, which is like, how do I support my son or daughter like how do I support my child how do I support my sibling how do I support my my brother or sister or my mom or what whatever do? if you don't live in the, in a major city like if you are outside of a major metropolitan area I was thinking how much more difficult is all of this because what oh. you're talking about I feel like is very connected to metro metropolitan area yeah. and therefore resources yeah, yeah. which is I mean, why people with disabilities pull in cities yeah it's we way end up different. we end up yeah we end up moving to cities i moved out of my um rural city of at that time like 130,000 people um because um uh it, there just was no resources or services um i had my accident within three months i was living back in my hometown within a year i moved back out just i just needed to be somewhere else that had transportation at least i, I was gonna say Mar least. i was gonna say marcus you probably had to move just to get out of the house like to try oh for transportation alone you needed to live somewhere different and yeah it, it's a huge issue and when when I talk with um, people who live in more rural areas I, I had to go to far southwest Virginia um, to for a project that I was working on and I thought I don't know what people do here like there's no businesses here I mean whether you have a disability or not there's like a McDonald's there's a gas station and there's a grocery store and so like that can't support all of the people that live in this community so what do you do except you drive however far away and if you have a disability you know is there can you drive is there a transportation services that that's going to pro provide that transportation to you. It, it makes it far more difficult for sure. 
I just wanted to ask, and and I, you know, I was at you. You're saying that, and I was thinking this is partially why I've seen tricked out tractors for wheelchair users. Uh, you know, people think people think that folks are just being cutesy about them modifying John Deere tractors to do X, Y, and Z because they're wheelchair. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's an adaptation. Mm -hmm. that, that's not them being cute because they were bored. It's because they there were no other options and there are no there are no services out here. So yeah, they do and, what they need to do. And, and that farmer acquired a disability because he fell underneath of that tractor right. and it cut him. And and this is the only thing he knows is to to sow his fields. And so he, you know, so he goes back to BR to try to get the accommodations he not, he needs in order to do the job he needs. But yeah, it, so it's either that or that's the only employment that's available. Yeah. I just wanted to ask the, 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 the last question that I have, and unless someone has something that, that they want to ask, uh, we can we can close out. But I, you mentioned earlier that the goal of your uh, job and the business is to accentuate the positives mm -hmm. for any potential client that you're working with, which I totally understand that and I can totally see it. But I also, when you were saying that I was thinking, but I don't know, I don't know how, how well that works because I was thinking, how do you explain a person's disability? Like even while you're accentuating all the things that they can do, how do you explain how a person's disability might impact their work because I feel like people who choose not to do that are setting up people for failure because I've seen that happen where I worked with a, an office in the feds they enjoyed me so much that when I left my coworker was like yeah we hired two more disabled people because they were so impressed with what you were doing but they it was a wildly different disability it was wildly different job things and it didn't work out at all and they were so disgusted with it that they scrapped the whole program. Mm -hmm. And now no one is working there. And I was right. just like, did I set those people up for failure? Like, is that my fault? Like, no. So I'm no. just I'm just kind of wondering, like, how do you balance this question of like, look at all these things that people can do, look at all these positives and all the work that they can do, but also recognize that these are the limitations of this person's mm -hmm. experience. And like it will not be the same as you know, mm -hmm. a person without a disability and are, and uh, expecting that is already okay. setting people up for a negative review, you know, yeah. no, no advancement, all that kind of stuff. I think really a few things. I think, I think finding that match and not only between what you are good at and what you want to do, but what the business needs so that we're making a good match there but also between work culture. So if you're a little bit more outgoing and a people person and enjoy, you know, Josh would need somewhere that they don't have thin skin because he's gonna make fun of you. And so if you're, if I put him in some stuffy business where everybody's real straight laced, that, that may not go over real well for Josh because and I'm just being honest, right, Josh? You know, so, so he needs somebody that's going to have that culture where we kind of kid back and forth, and that's okay. Um, and I think, I think that piece of more people are touched by disability now than ever. I think that plays into it, and I think highlighting success stories you know we talk a lot about where we have seen successes so that individual that I was talking about that works in the pharmacy they used to pay somebody a pharmacist to run those medications from the pharmacy to the outpatient infusion center and so and they when that person wasn't available they would ask a volunteer to do it and when the volunteer wasn't around then the pharmacist was doing it and the pharmacist might it might be an hour or more before they had time to run that those drugs and so cancer patients were sitting in chairs waiting for chemo for hours already anxious already stressed and now we've got to wait all this time to get my medication and so showing the business how 
this model and this individual is going to impact the bottom line and the culture of your business. So now that hospital's ratings, sat, customer satisfaction ratings have gone up because instead of waiting two hours for my meds, I'm waiting 15 minutes tops. And so, the, you know, sharing those types of success stories, but also sharing that you're, we're not going to dump a new employee in your lap and say, peace out, good luck to you. You get us all the time. And we're not going to leave until Josh is successful and independent and you, the business, is happy with Josh's work. And if it's not a good match, then we're going to say what needs to be done different. Do we need to revamp his work task? And I'm going to go back to the business and look at what tasks he, he could do that somebody else is doing. Or... Um, you know, where, what needs to be modified? What, what am I doing wrong that I need to be doing better as his job coach to better support him? And so I think helping the business understand that they have a, a support to them. And when things go wrong, we're going to be there to help out. And then we have to actually help out because you're exactly right. It's not always sunshine and roses and lollipops and rainbows. Things go wrong. But when you've made a connection to a person, so now I have this relationship with each of you and I've had just in an hour, you know, so as you build this relationship in these businesses, because Marcos is working there, or Josh is working there, you're seen as a, as a, a person of all these intersectionalities and you're connecting to people on a variety of ways. Yeah. Teresa, you, you had That's your great. hand up. So yeah, I was going to point out uh, Teresa's question just really quickly. Uh, do you have any other resources that you can think of uh, in your network of employment programs that like do either do this work or work with people with disabilities? That, that we could talk to, that was one of my questions. I mean, sent, you know, you, you go to conferences nationwide, I'm sure you speak to other people in this field. Could, you don't have to give us those now, but could you send us some other people that we could talk to and, and question about this, this sort of program that you found very helpful and informative when you've met with them? Um, and then, you know, your area of the state is you know just that like we were right. talking about that area what have you been successful at in getting these programs further out in the state and you mentioned the search program but um are, are there other things tools yeah. that you found useful so we when we find something that works we try to publicize it a lot and so we started out with that one project search site we talked about it we met it at state conferences I spoke at national events. Now we have 21 search sites in Virginia um, with more that are interested in coming. So, you know, yes, we do speak at conferences. We do write journal articles. We do send things out um, through our social media to, to say <coughs> what we're doing. Um, I train job coaches from all over the country and and we talk and have these discussions about what's working and how to connect with businesses. Um, we, we have a, a web course going on right now, and I think we have 350 job coaches in, and VR counselors in that course. Virginia's getting ready to send all of their job coaches through the course, so we, we do that as well. How long is that course? It's 12 weeks. It's six modules, and it's 12 weeks long. Okay, and it's uh, is that nationwide or is that statewide? It's nationwide, okay. and there are states that have said you must go through this course to provide services. And there, there's other you know similar how, training. How often do you run that course? Typically, about two times a year. Uh, although this year we may do it three. I yeah. may not be very happy at the end of that third course, but. <laughs> tracking those those students down but yeah <laughs> okay 
All right, that course tied to the link that Teresa sent. Um, she she sent that to us yesterday. Um, I wasn't able to look through it, but it was interesting. Oh, um, you you're talking about the title. program? Yes. So you uh, saw the news release, Governor Yunkin. I'm sure you were. Yeah, I saw it. I have not read it yet because it oh, came okay. late yesterday afternoon, and I hadn't had a chance to read it yet. So he's, you know, trying to encourage the links in the chat, uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, encourage the employment of people with disabilities and um, taking steps to do so, which I found very surprising. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that is very surprising. And I mean, like I said, um, yeah, I, I want to be mindful of folks' time, but I, I, it just, I think it speaks to the point you made earlier, Jennifer. I feel like COVID has suddenly, it's like blinders of just like, disappeared all folks eyes and they realized oh shit like when everybody wasn't working well who else is not working <laughs> like and they're just like look at all these other people that are oh, not working that haven't been working and it's like oh this is a problem and it makes me wonder how has disability touched his life that this is important to him mm -hmm. you know that we don't know i mean the reality is i i mean it's it seems cliche but it's the truth uh, the main character of Grey's Anatomy now has COVID and she can no longer stand for long periods of time. And, yeah. and like she, she can't even do her job the way that she's been doing it for the past 16 seasons. And they, the very first thing that they did was they were like, well, you know, she was like, am I fired? <laughs> do I not work here anymore? And they were like, of course you work here. Your name's in the building. So <laughs> they had to change her job description. And like now she works behind a desk and she helps people. She's still doing what she's doing, but it's just in a different way. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of the whole conversation is like, am I still a doctor now? Now that I'm no longer doing surgery or doing these things that I love, like what is the purpose of my life? And so COVID, that's a question that we have yet. I think it's coming. That is going to be a very big looming discussion that will pop off in about three to five years from now. Um, but I also know that Biden said that, you know, the Social Security Administration is looking into this and they're thinking about adding it to the ADA, like long well, and, that's, and that's that's what I think is different from Youngkin's is that, you know, he he gave some hard examples of what this is going to not just we're going to look into this, you know, mm -hmm. like you're talking about frequently an administration will say we support for, right. you know, employment. Yeah. Right. But, you know, they're saying agencies are now it does say strongly encouraged to provide a six month provisional period for new hires um, receive applicants receive priority consideration during the recruitment process. So those are some, you know, solid mm -hmm. things he's recommending. So, yeah, it's just like what we're talking about with the feds. The feds do this already, supposedly. Yeah, that's what I was thinking uh, when she said that right now is that you had mentioned that they that the um, in the federal government they that they already do a version of this. So well, and that's, that's one of the things when we're taught we've been talking, you know, looking at it that that the the public sector has more supports in place. It's the private sector that has taken some convincing. But when what Jennifer's talked about and it showed us is that those changes are coming for the private. Right. Well, and I think something we didn't talk about, but this brings to mind, you know, like I was saying, we don't know how disability has touched his life, but what we do know is that when disability, when there is a leader, whether it's a CEO, a president of a company has some connection to disability, they quickly embrace this um, inclusion mindset and will then voluntold all of their employees. And so I, I worked with a business last summer who had a child with autism and he was like, if we can't do this, who's going to do this? And so, you know, we have no idea if Youngkin has somebody in his life that that has a disability. And he's like, you know, we're, we're going to do this and we're not just going to say we're going to do it we're going to walk the walk we're gonna, you know not just talk the talk so yeah we've spoken about this in the group where we um where you know somebody of uh, fame or repute uh acquires a disability close to ours we we're not happy that they got a disability but we are happy that this is going to bring light to something mm -hmm. that we've been screaming into the void 
Um, and so, yeah, it's a very odd reaction for people who are self-aware, but, um, but yeah, we, we, we've had the conversation. It, it's, it's a weird emotion to have, but yeah, you do kind of like, oh, wow, you know, this rare uh, autoimmune thing that I have, so-and-so also has it, and now mm -hmm. more money is going to get funneled into it. Teresa, um, I just realized maybe we can, I mean, I have no idea, but maybe we can reach out to Youngkin's people to be like, I, what prompted this? <laughs> like, why? Like, it's a wonderful and we wholeheartedly approve, but like, why now? Um, because mm -hmm. I think that that would be a really interesting, if we could get a statement or something, it would be an interesting thing to add to the report to be like, you know, maybe this is something that can be replicated <laughs> with various governors. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I'll, I'll work on that. So yeah, okay. And then the, the Governor's Association is majority Republican. Um, so it, it makes a lot of sense um, to pitch it that way. Yeah. All right. So I hate to leave y'all because I have thoroughly enjoyed this discussion. And, um, but I have a 415 with somebody from Australia. So. Oh, of course, of course. Well, thank you so much. We, we thank y'all. Really and please reach out if you have any questions or if I can be of help in the future. It was good thank seeing you. you, Josh.